for coming out on this rainy but warm evening. <laughs> Thank you. 
Papiosko and Ben and Kaur. Thank you. In case you don't know who the, this guy is, it's Larry Kramer. It's Jane Bennett's husband and longtime uh, collaborator and co-conspirator in music of all different kinds. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, John. So, it's Jane. You've been part of my adult life, um, my <laughs> whole adult life. <laughs> In listening, and so nice. it's, it's incredible to you know sit down and go, oh my gosh! So I've I've known you in my head for you know thirty years. Thank you. It's it's pretty incredible what you've done, and I'm just back from Colombia, and one of the things that I did while I was there is I took a workshop on what we generically call salsa because I've never been able to figure out the rhythms because you know with my classical music brain I'm like okay well this rhythm is going like this and this rhythm is going like this and and how does it all fit together and of course I learned that the the secret to the music and as anybody who was out there in the audience with their head kind of going like this is that the real rhythm is in the friction of all those different rhythms mm -hmm. together and it creates a whole rhythm of its own that you mm. don't hear but you feel it but I'm going back 30 years, and here are you guys in Cuba for the first time. And you're listening to this music, and you're thinking, hey, we want to be a part of this. Um, but I'm, I'm assuming you hadn't actually ever tried it before. Well, I, you had played a little bit, I think, in some, some salsa bands, but I, I think I had played a little bit more in terms of, I, I met a wonderful musician, unfortunately, who, who passed away um, named Ramiro Puerta. Puerta. He was from Colombia, actually, and he had a group called um, Ramiro's Latin Orchestra. So um, often, um, we as jazz musicians fill out the bands, um, the salsa bands. So there was only like one or two in Toronto at the time. So they would hire um, jazz musicians uh, to, to play some of the solos within the music and read the charts that a lot of the guys would bring from their countries. In particular, in Ramiro's group, there was a guy from Chile, some, Ramiro, Ramiro was from Colombia, somebody from Peru, another guy from Argentina. There wasn't a Cuban in the group, actually. There wasn't any Cubans in, in Toronto at that point. And um, so I had a little bit of a taste of it, but not the full-on Fumati of Cuban music that Larry and I experienced that, that, that first night in Cuba, which was intense. And um, you want, would you like to say something how, about How this? hard was it to actually stand up there and play? Well, it wasn't really. It was just, you know, we, this was kind of like a thunderbolt that kind of hits you as soon as we get to a place. You know, there was, you know, what people call Latin jazz. And when we were developing our careers, we didn't, you know, Latin jazz was very commercial out of Los Angeles or, uh, you know, it was a, a hybrid that was very commercial. And when we went to Cuba, we heard the real thing immediately and it hit us. And first in Santiago de Cuba, which is on the eastern side, we heard uh, music that included a lot of folkloric, the conga, exactly the conga. You got your horn with you? Yeah. The conga is a music that, that was our first spot actually. The first day we arrived, we met the first musician who is still a, a very close friend of ours. His name is Paisan. He's in his 80s now, but he remembers that first day when we met and he remembers what I said, what he said, even though he doesn't speak any English. And <laughs> He said, I went, hey! And he, and he went, said, whoa! Hey, hey, <laughs> and that was sort of the beginning of this relationship. And then we heard, so as soon as we got off the bus, and yeah, as soon as we got off the bus, this is what we heard. <laughs> that! And I was like, wow! Are there any, boom, 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 boom. So this is killing. Cool train. <laughs> is there anyone of Chinese descent in here? Well, this they call it. This is called the. This was China's contribution to Cuban music. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> it's really true. But there were a lot of Chinese workers or slaves, I guess you'd call them, back then. And this was the instrument that they brought for the carnival, and it rose. As you can hear by the sound of it, it rose above, it went back to the African call and response music. So this, this, why, why don't you play that, More? that theme? <laughs> More? Which one? The, the opening line? You have to clear a few seats. What, the opening line or? I do that. Oh, 
So that would be the, the, the call to sing. Adios, mama. Adios, papa. Adios, mi boy. You know, so you could hear this above all the drums. And, and so as soon as we, we got out of the, the, um, the bus, somebody was playing that music. And, and it was like, whoa. Yeah. And then we, drummers. It was, it and then we got wild. up and we said, well, we can, you know, we exotic, can play. Exotic, you know, mm -hmm. very exotic. And, and that night we played and that was sort of the beginning of everything. And from there we went and we worked with the people in Santiago. Then we heard a different music coming out of Havana. And we said, where does that come from? Havana. And then we, we ended up spending years there working on our first project. But I, I've, I've yet to meet a, a musician in Latin America who isn't absolutely eager to share everything they know, everything they've done, um, and make sure that you've learned it exactly it's, the way uh, you're supposed really to. That's really true. Well, two of those musicians were, uh, later if people want to take a look at these photos. That, this was Mercedes Valdez, who was, um, uh, she was really the, the, one of the great voices of Cuba. And um, uh, she would be on par with Celia, Celia Cruz, but she stayed in Cuba. And she was um, a great interpreter of the Afro-Cuban popular music, but also the religious music. The, um, and um, she, was, she was quite the voice and quite the lady. And uh, we recorded our first recording with Mercedes in 1990, which took us about two years to cut through the red tape of making that recording. She was very instrumental in um, the group that we, we chose, Yoruba and Dabo, um, which was a folkloric group, uh, but she worked with, with this group, which they were not allowed to go into the studio, the recording studio, because everybody has identification cards, and uh, you're registered if you're uh, a librarian or if you're in the, you know, the various uh, levels of government. And these guys were all dock workers, and this is where this music is performed in the ports. That's how it developed with, with um, the unloading of, of boxes from the, from the boats. And um, anyway, it was a good year just to get those guys cards so that they could go into the recording studio. And this was her husband, um, Guillermo Barreto, who um, was a huge, uh, not only jazz fan, but a great jazz drummer. And he had worked with the likes of Sarah Vaughan, Nat King Cole. Um, well, in in pre-revolutionary. Right. Exactly. They were, he At was, the top jazz clubs. He had a beautiful 55 uh, Chevy with the original air conditioner that he just loved that car. But he, you know, he was going nonstop in the 50s. He was with a scene. I mean, a scene, if you were a musician or if you were doing well, it was wonderful those years. Uh, the mid to late 50s. I mean, the he casinos was going were very busy, yes. <laughs> you know, because they were playing like jazz musicians do. They were up all night doing a session, going out to a club doing this. There were, there were a lot of drugs and women and all those kind of things. Bet you wish you were there, right? <laughs> <laughs> Bring it on. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway these, these two, we were really covered. They were our, our mother and father to Cuban music. Mercedes was the folkloric person and Guillermo was the jazz person and, and that's where we put our dreams together um, for our first record which took four or five years. You know. right. Well I, I mean we've all heard the music but I, I was wondering how did you navigate all the, the little political things that you had to get done in the beginning especially? Oh, going to many trips to Honest Ed's and giving little gifties to people every time you went down there. There was pens and panties and... <laughs> right? And now it's Dollarama. Sorry, Ed. <laughs> Sorry, Ed. <laughs> oh, it was really a lot of greasing wheels, I have to admit. Wasn't it? Mm -hmm. what, was there a point at, 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 at which the, I mean, the, the local authorities, at any rate, would kind of realize that what you were doing was, was a really good thing for Cuba in terms of, of yes. getting its music out? I think there was a few people that rec recognized that at the time, especially Mercedes and Guillermo. It was very important for them to, to hear that the music get outside of Cuba. And the, many of the musicians that we were meeting, it, they re really engaged in the, um, in the outer... Uh, I can't think of the word right now. I'm sorry. Um, outsiders coming in and working with them. It was giving, you know, it was giving them something to sort of um, not look forward to, but uh, how do I can't. What's the word? Um, hopeful. 
beautiful, thank you. My sister's always great for this stuff. That's why we put her right here. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and they were enthusiastic and knew our intentions were, were sincere. And I mean, I have to say, you know, we spent a lot of time, just a lot of time just hanging out with people down there and playing. And um, on the outside, it looks like we were just like driven to, uh, make a recording, but it wasn't a good, it wasn't for a good seven years that we really um, made, you know, made a recording. We were studying and learning and, and, and as corny as it sounds, we're still learning now as every time we go to Cuba, there's something new that, you know, the music does continue to evolve there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, I've noticed, I mean, like hip hop, for example, has been, been starting to blend in. Oh, with, yeah with the music, and I, I was going to ask you if yeah. you've, you've been dipping your toes in that. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. Well, we've been working with the vocalist, Telmari Diaz, who's a very uh, wonderful uh, voice, and she's on our new recording, um, our two CD, which not here today, but soon, the next day or so. Um, uh, she's, she's incredibly uh, experimental, but she's also very versed in this music, too. I mean, that's the thing with the, with the Cuban musicians that's so um, incredible. Um, Benincourt and, and Papiosco, they, they understand the, the, found, the real foundations of the music, and, and so everything else that comes to them becomes um, sort of uh, techniques or ingredients that you can you know, throw into the pot. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, there's always a Cuban is up to any challenge, you know, and artistically more than anything. It's just you throw an idea out, and it's just wonderful where they can. I mean, you can be walking along a street in Old Havana or Santiago, and you hear some music going on, and you can. Can I tell the story about the camel? <laughs> okay, go ahead. So we just we just came sorry we just came back from. Uh, we took the uh, Jazz 91 listeners down to, to Cuba for the Jazz Festival in December, which, by the way, was a great trip. And um, I looked out the hotel we were staying at, and there was a camel in the field. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cuba's not known for its camels, by the way. <laughs> so anyway, I said, But nothing surprises you in Cuba. What is a camel doing there? So I said to Larry, come on, let's go with the camera. Let's go down, and I'm going to get on the camel. I'm going to ride that camel. So I took my horns. We took our horns, got on the camel, got up on the camel, and started to play a night in the Tunisia. da 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 Musicians started running out of the woods. <laughs> this guy with his trumpet, he was like, Boy. he started, like, we're in the middle of nowhere. Somebody and starts playing the trumpet. He starts answering us. I can't believe it, this whole band. So they heard us, and we started playing. And it's actually up on YouTube, isn't it? Or, yeah, what does it say? Facebook. Facebook. So that was, like, yeah, there's always something happening there. Great. <laughs> or you're walking in the streets of Havana and you hear music, so you walk into somebody's house and then you partake, you know, usually if you bring a bottle of rum or something that helps, but, it, and then this guy knows this person. Well, empty-handed. You know, it's really a very open, like, culturally, it's, a, it's an amazing society. Well, it's something about it, the fact that everybody's doors are open and everybody's windows are open. It's not like Toronto, right. you know, you're not doing that. Well, you go back to the folkloric <laughs> music. You'd be in, in central Havana. One time we were rehearsing with a, a great musician, Amato, from Clave Wamonko. And we were sitting rehearsing and we see these kids like in diapers, like playing the drums. I said, well, where do they live? They said, oh, they live down the street. I said, what, they just I said, yeah, well, if, if the mother hears that the drums are going, then they know the kid's okay. If the son's not in the They're house, he of. knows that he's up the street with the music. Yeah, it's really true. We thought that this child was somebody's child at the rehearsal. And he said, no, no, he lives up the street. He just walks down and everybody pats his head as he walks down the street and into the rehearsal. It was miraculous. You know. So I mean, you've, you've spent a lot of time traveling to other places as well, and you spent a lot of time in Toronto. How much, I mean, how much time do you still spend in Cuba? every year? Well, it's really project driven, I think. Um, uh, last year, we, we were there quite a bit. We, we have a, a music program that we do called the Spirit of Music. We take instruments down there, and we take technicians, and there's 25 conservatories in Cuba. So that's an ongoing uh, project uh, for us, and uh, preparing for a recording. Sometimes you have to go down there to get somebody out of Cuba. You can't do it from here. You have to, 
um, you know, go down and, and work with the various levels of government to prepare the papers for musicians' travel. So it could be like up to three times a year. Okay. You know, we try and time it with snow. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, it's also nice to find musicians coming out of, of Cuba and mentoring them. That's something we hope to work on in the future. Um, uh, we've always supported bringing Cuban, you, you know, the Cuban government sometimes thinks we bring people in you know, get them to leave. We've never, you know, if somebody wants to leave, we'll, you know, help them out when they're here. But, you know, as a jazz musician or as a musician, you need to travel. That, that's the key point. So a perfect example is a young piano player, David Varelli is from Santiago. We, we actually met him at his conservatory and Jane won, I think it was the Toronto Arts Award. Uh, and she won, I think, uh, was re received 2,500 as a protege award where you could get somebody to make you a table or a piece of art. So we brought David up for we two weeks. We tried to make him into a table, no. <laughs> <laughs> we brought him up for two weeks to study with some of the top musician piano players in Toronto. And so that lasted for, for like four years. <laughs> and now he's in, he's in New York and he's playing uh, next week Ravi with Ravi Coltrane at the uh, Kerner Hall and he's doing, he's one of the top piano players on board. So I think you find musicians, you know, the, the really funny thing is that the real fascinating thing about um, where we ended up in Cuba was that in jazz there's always been a connection between Cuba and jazz. You know, from Dizzy and Chano Pozo and even in the early days with Duke Ellington Orchestra and there was that connection and then 1960 it all ended. But there was a revolution in Cuba, but at that point, there was a revolution in jazz that Cuba missed out on with John Coltrane and all this, and it was, had a very strong Af African influence. So Cuba missed that whole period, and that's the period of music that we loved and, and grew up on and were trying to work with. I think that's actually what sort of helped us make the transition, and not that it was a transition, but uh, that we felt the connection between that music, be like Larry just said, when we were hearing the Afro-Cuban folkloric music, um, you know, there's certain um, uh, standards in, in jazz, in, in, in modern jazz, of Coltrane, Farrell Saunders, uh, of the jazz literature that almost feels like an extension of, of, of some of those African chants. So, it felt very natural, you know, because they ha it has the African root um, in, in common. And because Americans didn't go there, couldn't go there, or felt they couldn't go there, it was, there was that big gap. So we just sort of strolled in by accident and, and ended up, you know, creating so many projects and we're, we always keep being drawn back even when we're sick of it, you know? So only so many trips to Dollarama, right, Jane? Yeah, well, I know you hate it. I love Dollarama, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Dollarama nut. Oh, but, uh, yeah. Along the way, you've, you've kind of helped make Toronto a little bit of a, of a center of, of all kinds of neat experimental I stuff where, that has brought together people. I think we have, actually, because, uh, you know, uh, I never... Th I, people have told me that, at, like, five, six years ago, and I didn't believe it, but um, in the last, just the last few years, uh, now, so many of the young Cuban musicians, they want to come to Toronto. They used to want to go to New York. They wanted to go to the Bronx. That, that's where all of the Cubans were going. People want to come here. They know what a great country uh, well, Toronto is really the, is, is is the capital outside of Havana, even compared to New York. Spanish is going to be a second language soon, folks. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> But if I can mention one thing that, that, that Larry and I have been pretty um, advocates of like when we have been with a lot of the, the young students to, to tell them, you know, you're never going to be able to practice like you can practice in Cuba. Uh, it, when they, if they want to come here and they're in their 20s, they're going to, it's, right now like a lot of the kids, you know, they, they play seven, eight hours a day and that will not happen here because you've got to do something else to uh, get by, you know, for a while. Right. Well, that's yeah, like if you I tell them the I worked, uh, you know, I cleaned health clubs, I worked, uh, you know, at coffee shops, I waitressed badly. Well, that's <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why El Sistema in Venezuela is so incredible because they they put in the hours because they love to put in the hours. Mm. It's three to four hours a day. Yeah, or even more, you know. 
you have some rivals. And uh, I, mean, I mean, you walk down any street in, in, in any town in, in South America, and the music is there. It's just there all the time. Yeah, it's part the of the culture. It's just there. The yeah, music's yeah. always on. But in certain places, it's, it's developed in terms of a higher, higher level, you know, mm -hmm. like in Cuba and, um, and um, Venezuela and Brazil as well, you know. So there's there's a, a documentary that's coming out fairly soon. That, that's I, it was I, playing earlier, yeah. and it's going to hopefully maybe play, it's play at the as end. we leave. It's being uh, made by Lisa Pelosi, who's here. If you're here, Lisa, stand up. There she is. The There's Lisa back there. She's been working four years on this, um, long time, and um, this was for a recording called "Embracing Voices" that worked with. Uh, we were working with um, a Cuban. Haitian group called Grupo Vocal Descendant, which is now renamed Creole Choir of Cuba, because Peter Gabriel renamed them. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. <laughs> That's good for my record. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, it was, it's, it's, it's all about the ups and downs of the music business and uh, creative, you know, uh, creative juices not flowing, flowing relationships, it uh, has us in, in Cuba, in Banff, in Toronto, and went traveling all over. Um, and it's a really wonderful film, and I, I thank you so much for um, At the Junos, that was fun, where some little kid, some little kid came up, to, uh, Larry was interviewing her and saying, uh, she was sitting there with her autograph book, and, and Larry said to her, yeah, have you ever heard of Jane Bennett? She said, yeah, I love her stuff. <laughs> <laughs> She was, little Miss, she, she was Little Miss Juno. <laughs> and then she sang a pink tune for, for us. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Do, do you wonderful. know when, when this will, will be available for, for people to, to view yet? When, Lisa. When, Lisa. <laughs> okay, so coming soon. Coming, coming soon, soon. Thank to you. A okay. local theater near you. So it's, it's just about time for the Q&A. But before we do the Q&A from everybody in the room, mm -hmm. um, I think there's a little bit more music coming mm -hmm. out, right? We're going to play, um, I'm going to play La Grimace Negris, and I, I have to turn this off, right, or I'll really blow everybody's eardrums out. Papiosco. We lost, oh, there are the guys. Come. This song is called La Grimace Negris. It's a very famous uh, tune. It's called, uh, translates into Black Tears. So happy piece. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's written by a great Cuban composer, uh, Miguel Matamoros. He wrote in the 30s and 40s. And it's one of the few Cuban songs that doesn't have the word Corazon in it. <laughs> no, it doesn't. I think it's the only one. Are you sure? 